Connecting, and I think we are going to be live here in a second. One second, five, four, three, two, and we're live. Excellent. All right, so welcome everybody uh, to yet another episode of the Bench Doctor. Um, I'm Ed, and I'm not going to talk much. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Scott here in a minute to uh, talk about uh, stoning an AR trigger, and uh, we'll leave all the jokes until after uh, I stop. I mute myself. Uh, he was supposed to put together the rest of his trench gun, some of the pieces you can see on the screen, but the parts have still not arrived. So we can blame the Postal Service delays or something to that effect, or the wildfires, or any of the other natural disasters that are happening out there in the world, but the parts have not arrived, so hopefully next week uh, the parts will be here and we can finish that, sh that shotgun that we started two weeks ago. Uh, if you got questions, drop them into the... Uh, uh, Zoom chat. Uh, if you're on Discord, uh, we're monitoring that as well. If you are uh, on Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, or Twitter, we're not monitoring those actively. I'm sorry. I only have so many eyes, ears, and hands, and we only have so many moderators on. So uh, next time, sign up for the class and join the Zoom or become a member and join the members only Discord. Uh, so with that being said, unless I've missed anything, Scott, you want to bring us up to date on where sure. we are with the Trench Gun Project and then sure. march into what you're going to show us tonight? Yeah. So I'm waiting on the, uh, the part that is the heat shield for the trench gun barrel. It, it goes from the, uh, this end of the barrel, and it, it's a shroud. And it, there's, a, there's one guy that makes them to, to match military specs. And he's a crusty old guy and he makes them on his own sweet time. And uh, you get it when you get it. And I ordered it a while back. I'm going to reach out to him gently this week and prod him and see what's really going on there. But in the interim, I decided to just tear the gun down since I function checked it, made sure everything worked. And I started the bluing process uh, last week. And so these are some of the pieces that I've finished. Um, I don't know if you remember how ratty that gun was, but this piece was just bare metal with surface rust on it. This is the end cap for the, um, the magazine tube. And then this is the follower for inside the magazine. And then this is the band, the, the band that holds the um, uh, magazine tube and the barrel together. So this is the color blue that I'm after. And these are all pieces that I've, I, I'm doing a rust bluing process. This is the pin that you use for the takedown. So this is the color that I'm after right now. This is the state of the barrel, which is this velvety rust color, which is exactly what you want. Um, so I'm, I'm just, every night I come out and uh, do one more round of rust bluing. If you don't know what that is, you, you uh, strip the old bluing off and then you uh, sand all of the parts down to bare metal you do a couple of passes with 220 grit and then 320 grit, and then you uh, degrease it and you apply a um, chemical to it. It's a, uh, I use, I'm using uh, this stuff, this uh, Brownells classic blue, and you, you put it on there very carefully. I use a cotton swab. It seems to work really well and you don't rub it. You just put a quick pass on it and you cover the whole thing and you let it set for 24 hours here in Oregon. It's great because we have such uh, so much humidity in the air that things naturally just rust, including the residents. But this is what you want. You want this fine orange velvety rust all over everything. Then you take that and you throw it in a, uh, a pan or a pot and boil it for about 15 minutes. And it turns that rust black. And then you go at it with um, what's called a carding wheel or super fine, like triple odd or quadruple odd buck, uh, I mean, buck, um, steel wool. And you polish that black rust off and you're left with this. And it, this is about five or six passes of the, that process to get to this point. So it's time consuming, but it's really fun. And uh, it's fun to see the results of it. So that's where we're at with the gun. It, it won't take long to reassemble it once everything's been blued. And um, uh, so, but as soon as the hangar comes in, we will then be in a position to put it all together. I'll have to rust blue the handguard as well because it comes in the white. 
So in the interim, we decided that there was some interest in, in how to stone a, a, uh, an AR trigger or how to smooth an AR trigger out. I don't know if, if you've built your own AR from a, a, a mil spec parts kit, you know, Anderson or, you know, some of those brands, DPMS, they all come with a, just a, a mil spec trigger, which is fine. They work. Um, but they're, they're kind of gritty and uh, they're not real crisp and clean. And so today I figured I'd show you how to do it. And, and this is similar to what you would do on a lot of gun triggers, but the geometry of the AR trigger lends itself to uh, a first timer pretty easily uh, versus say a 1911 trigger, which requires special jigs uh, to maintain, you know, exact angles of uh, some of the surfaces where the hammer notch, um, you know, connects up to this to the sear and you know you do not want to screw up. Uh, it's very dangerous to screw up those um, those angles and that geometry on those triggers. So I figured I'd show you what it means when somebody says they've stoned a trigger. Um, I'll show you how to do it. And on an AR trigger, it, it's pretty easy to do as long as you just pay attention and go slow. So right here is, you know, this is just a, this is the cheapest trigger I could find. It's out of a, uh, this was in my parts bucket. And uh, it's, I usually replace these. I just take them and, and put a Geisley in or whatever, depending on the point of the rifle. And, uh, but you can, you can actually do quite well with these. So if you can see, um, you can see this surface right here. It's got this kind of sort of black matted rough surface, you know, cause it's a cast part. I don't know if the detail, but it, it looks sort of velvety. It's a cast part. So there's really no finish on it whatsoever. And then this is what I'm after. I don't know if you can see how shiny that is. This is what, this is what this looked like before I, I went at it with uh, the techniques I'm going to show you today. This is the hammer face that strikes the uh, um, firing pin. So there's no real reason to polish this surface. I just did it as an example of what we're looking for. This is the finished result. Um, and this was just done with um, some, some stones and a little bit of sandpaper and some metal polish. Um, and if you don't know much about AR triggers, I, I have a, a AR lower, obviously not loaded because there's no barrel on it and there's no magazine in it. But um, what I'm gonna, I'll show you what we're doing here before we get started. So this is what your trigger is gonna look like in the gun. I'm gonna try to lay this out. So what, what you're doing is, this is your sear right here. This, this front part of the trigger assembly. This little corner uh, 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 connects with the trigger in this little notch in the hammer. This is the hammer, and then this is the hammer notch, and this is the sear. The other place where these two connect is right here on the disconnector. You have this spur right there, this little spur, and it locks into this surface right here on your disconnector, I mean on your, your um, hammer. So this is the disconnector. And this is the hammer. And I'm gonna show you how they work with this lower. So right now we have our hammer back as if the gun is cocked and ready. Now, if I pull the trigger, uh, put it in fire, pull the trigger, the hammer slams forward. So what it's doing is this sear is dropping, which then releases this notch, the hammer goes forward. So that's what happens when you pull an AR trigger. This drops and lets it go. Okay, so the hammer travels forward like so. And uh, then if I hold the trigger down, the, uh, the whole assembly is gonna come back and recock the trigger. And with my finger down, now on a full auto, this, this trigger would just keep slapping until you're out of ammo. But on a semi-automatic, if I let my thumb go, you'll see the reset, that reset the trigger. So what it did is the disconnect caught right there up on this notch. And then when I let the trigger go, it let the sear connect with the hammer. So that it, re it redid this connection for me. So that's, that's your disconnector. You let the disconnector go, which is to let the trigger reset. And it now 
reconnects where that sear is. So what we're gonna do to make these better is we smooth, you see this, this face right here has machine marks in it. And it's, if you run a pick or something uh, fine across it, it sounds like sandpaper, you know, and it will work, this trigger will work, it will function, but it'll be kind of gritty and crunchy as you pull the trigger. It won't be that nice smooth take up with a crisp reset or I mean a crisp break. So we're gonna, we're gonna polish this surface right here and this surface right here. But what we don't wanna do is dull this edge or change this edge in any way. So when we're doing this, we have to make sure that this whole area is in contact with whatever media we're using. And I use uh, an Arkansas stone and some oil stones. The other surfaces that we're gonna go after, and this one is a difficult one, and, and you can actually, if you just did the hammer uh, and the sear, you would be fine. You would, you would get a lot of uh, benefit out of just doing those two surfaces if you don't wanna tackle the disconnector and then this notch here. But you'll see in here, the angle right here, we have this curvature and in there, it's, it's difficult to get in there and polish that surface because uh, we wanna maintain that radius. And so I have some jeweler's files that I use, but what I do is I reach in there with a pick and I feel if there's any burrs or any roughness. Uh, if there's no burrs or roughness, I skip uh, filing or stoning that surface at all because it's just very difficult to maintain that, that exact radius. Um, so I go to a really fine sandpaper and then I use a metal polish to do the best I can with that. Um, and because we do not want to break this edge, we don't want to damage this edge. And the other thing you can do is the underside of this disconnector right here. You know, you can polish these two surfaces without messing that up. Now, the thing about AR triggers is these are not uh, hardened pieces, the whole piece is cast and then the these surfaces are just surface hardened so you can't remove a bunch of material it will you'll you'll uh, work right through the hardening surface and end up ruining the trigger so what we're doing is we're not removing material we're just smoothing it out we're just polishing it we're, we're not trying to uh, take off a whole bunch of material you don't want to see a bunch of metal shavings come out of this so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna take this and knock that pin out. I just had it in there to show you what it, uh, how it went together. Grab a little hammer, knock this pin out. And grab a little tighter punch here. And if you've never taken a trigger out of your AR-15, it's very simple to do. It's not a big deal. Just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show it to you sometime. Maybe if we have time after this, I can show you how to do it. So I'm gonna take this piece and start with this, which is my sear. And I use an Arkansas stone uh, for most of this. This is a, a stone surprisingly from Arkansas. It's a super fine stone. It's, um, and I put a little bit of oil on there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move it back and forth, holding this sear face to that stone, maintaining that angle the entire time. And it do, you don't take a lot of pressure. You let the stone do the work. So I'm gonna put just a little dab of oil on there. Like what kind so. of oil is that? This is just regular old gun oil. You can use any kind of super lightweight oil. So I just wanna make sure. And so I'm gonna do this at this angle, hopefully so you can see kind of what I'm trying to do, but I'm just trying to maintain that angle. That geometry. I don't want to change it. And I just kind of go back and forth, back and forth. And just keep going. Then you check it. And we're just trying to get those little machine marks out of there. We're, we're not going, I'm not putting any pressure on the, the part itself. I'm just letting that surface do its job. And you can find these Arkansas stones. I got this one on uh, Brownells. I don't know if you can see that that's brightening up already. Um, you, I, I can't really get the detail that I would like to show you, but how much of that, um, uh, those tool marks are coming out of it. 
So this takes a few minutes. And the funny thing is really the only part of this that we're really worrying about is this, this very top edge. You know, you can see that the two pieces don't interface that much. You know, that's the extent of how much of that really needs stoning. But I just do the whole face because it's easier. It's, it's easier to maintain that angle if I use the whole thing and don't concentrate on that one little area. And then I'll take it over this side put a little bit of oil on the edge. It helps to have a file with a with a square corner like this because uh, in some places you want to maintain that right angle. So this is all I'm doing is back and forth. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's it's a super fine stone, but it does a really good job. It's just made for polishing. It's not even really a sharpening stone. You would use this, uh, if you were sharpening knives, this would be the last thing you do to sort of dress up the edge. Um, Keep expecting you to paint happy little trees at any second. I should, I should. So, How does this compare to like a very fine grit sandpaper? One of the questions was, uh, can we do this on 3000 grit wet dry yeah. sandpaper on glass? Yeah, I mean, you could, yeah, so if you had a super flat surface, like this is a wet and dry paper, you could do the same thing, you know. It's what okay. I use, you know, that, that works just as well. Um, I, I recommend having an Arkansas stone, though. It's a very handy tool to have for sharpening knives and, and uh, polishing, you know, not just triggers, but, um, you know, anything that needs a, a fine metal polish. They're really, really handy to have. So I'm always very careful to make sure that that's sitting flush. And when you're uh, applying any, well, you're not really applying pressure, correct? You're no. just letting the weight of your hand push the. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, you know, if you, I don't want to remove material. That's the, that's the, the important thing to remember here is to not, we're just smoothing out the surface. You get a rag and see where we're at with that. But you can see, I, I, you probably can't see the detail but you can see where we have these lines starting to form where that is now flush with this outside edge so we're getting we're getting it smoother and smoother as we go and if you just feel it with your finger or a pick you can already feel the smoothness but that's not nearly as smooth as i like so we keep going with it but this is tedious but it, it really you can take a cheap 20 dollars ar trigger and really make it uh you know, not unpleasant to shoot instead, you know, if you don't have the money to uh, put into a, you know, a Geisley or a, an expensive trigger, this, this will help a lot. Or you can work it in circles. Sometimes that helps. And sometimes this will help you see where the high spots are by uh, swirling it. You can see, you will then see the slight bit of um, raised area in the finish. This camera just doesn't give me the detail that I would need to, um, illustrate that. I, I don't have anything that can get to that micro level, but um, so I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and keep checking it. And, you know, but the important thing is to, to keep an eye on this edge right here. We don't want to dull that. We don't want to round that off. We want to keep it nice and sharp. So, you know, you can also, um, somebody mentioned sandpaper. You can, you know, like, like we were saying, use the sandpaper and you could go with a heavier grid. This is 600. I don't like to go much less, uh, 400. This is an oil stone. Um, I have, uh, four, six and eight. Uh, I'll show you where I use these, but so anyway, that's what I would continue to do on this one. That one's pretty straightforward on the, uh, hammer notch. This gets a little bit more difficult. And this is where I like to use the stones. You can see that that right angle, so this stone is good for getting in there like that and maintaining that geometry. And I can just work it back and forth like that very lightly. I'm not putting any pressure on the stone. Was there oil on this? There isn't right now, but there normally would be. Yeah, but I just wanted to show you what I'm doing. And it, but that maintains that, that angle. I'll put a little bit of oil on there. That's where the right angle on a stone comes in handy. 
to help you uh, guide that. I don't know if you can see it, but it, it's maintaining that perfect right angle right there. You just go back and forth, back and forth. You can buy a set of these oil stones on Amazon and they start at like 80 grit and go down to a thousand. Um, and then you can get in there and get this other surface. Sometimes this one isn't small enough. So I would probably do this other surface with a very fine sandpaper right in there. And just, you're just deburring it. You're not, Got to remember that you're polishing, not not uh, removing material. Just keep going like that, and you'll feel it get smoother as you go. You'll feel less and less resistance on the paper. So that's how you do the hammer notch, and then um, on here you can see this is another nice little uh, crisp angle that makes the oil stones. A good candidate here. Just back and forth, back and forth. And then maintain that correct angle, like so. So I will do this. And it, it, it will take a good hour to do these surfaces right, you know, just sitting here. It's nice to have like, you know, an a, a audio book or a, a TV on, you know, just, just paying attention to what you're doing. But, you know, something in the background, some music or whatever, and just sit here and work on it, set it down, walk away from it. Be just being careful to mind those edges. But you can see the way the finish is coming off here, that it's pretty even between this edge and this edge. So I'm not favoring one or the other, which maintains that angle right there. You don't want to see all of the material being removed off this leading edge. That would be the, that would illustrate that you are, in fact, not maintaining that angle. So, you know, and it's it's slowly removing that whatever that finish they put on there is. But since this is bigger and it's easier to show, I'll just finish up these two surfaces. What I figured I'd do is I'd finish this trigger either during the this video or uh, tonight and then if somebody wants it I'll just throw it in the mail uh, if somebody wants to try it in their gun and uh, you can have a polished trigger courtesy of my uh, parts bin I think I have a few of these because I normally replace them when I get a lower parts kit insert legal disclaimer here Yes, I am not responsible for said trigger or what you do with it. And uh, also, I'm not saying this is the only way you can do this. There's other ways you can do it. This is the way I do it, and I've had good luck with it. You'll see some people take Dremel tools. Uh, please don't. Uh, if you do, you're on your own. Uh, there's no reason to other than you're impatient. Uh, you know, you can use a Dremel tool with like a, part, uh, a polishing wheel on it and some jeweler's rouge, that stuff works really well. But beyond that, there's really no reason to use any kind of a power tool on this process. We're just, we're just finishing metal. We're not shaping it. We already have a volunteer for the recipient of the trigger. All right then. Oh hell, there's at least three. <laughs> okay, well they can have it. They're just, uh, I'll let Danielle, she's the, the poor person uh, that supervises this uh, this gang of miscreants, so she can choose and I'll and give me their uh, name and address, and I'll throw it in the mail this week. Well, if I get to choose, I'm picking myself. Oh, yeah, I was okay. going to say she was one of the volunteers, so. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's out of my hands. Yeah, so it's getting smoother. It just takes time, and uh, now if I. I don't know if you can hear but it's getting smoother and smoother yeah we might end up with a lottery because there's a okay you're you're a popular guy scott yeah I, I, well they they want plausible deniability when the trigger doesn't work i didn't do it 
No, Is Mr. This ATF. Of... This 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 guy from my gun club sent it to me. Or when it goes full auto. Yeah, that's what what will usually happen if you screw up an AR trigger. It won't go full auto. You'll get what's called hammer fire. I mean hammer follow, where the hammer will uh, strike the and then it won't yeah. come back and um, the the disconnector won't catch it, so it'll just go forward and then the thing's dead. It becomes a single shot rifle at that point. So you're not gonna your gun isn't gonna run away and become full auto. Now your your 1911s can do that if you do it wrong, but your ARs will just become a single shot rifle if you screw it up, which is good to know because I'd rather I'd rather err on the side of single shot than maybe than go full auto. I wish it were that easy to make them go full auto. I would uh, never do it, but. Right, Ed? Is the ATF guy displaying on the screen right now? No, it is not, but it, he's there in spirit. Yeah, I know. Nah, I, I, it's not worth 10 years of my time to mag dump faster than I can normally do it. I'll just go ahead and put that, that up there now. Yeah. Yeah, there he is. Well, then we'll come back to you. Yeah. So this is very tedious to listen to me prattle on, but that's the nature of the beast. And at this so, point, it's probably smoother now than, it. you know, I'm sure it's much smoother than it was, but I take it, like I said, all the way down to where it's glinting, you know, like it's, it's like chrome. That's what I want it to look like. I want it to be super shiny. And uh, let's try to maybe move, move on to uh, a little bit of flits. We'll see if in a little bit of, I use this stuff a lot. If you've never heard of it, it's a metal polish. It's about the consistency of, of a wet, you know, a slightly runny toothpaste and you just put it on the part, the surface that you want to polish and you just kind of go at it with a rag or a, uh, wire, or a um, cotton wheel. And normally if it were bigger, I'd be going in circles, but this is all I can do from this point. And then this will really, uh, it'll polish it even finer. Um, but so anyway, that's a lot smoother than it was, but it's not as smooth as I would like it. So I'll probably, uh, we're about a half an hour in, um, I'll probably just finish this offline and uh, send it to whomever I'm instructed to send it to. Um, I wanted to go kind of go into a little bit about AR triggers though. Uh, I, but I wanted to make sure you understood the surfaces that we're dealing with is this, the top of the trigger this magazine, or I mean the uh, disconnector right here, this hook. And we're dealing with the hammer notch right here. And then this little edge right there. So those are the surfaces that you wanna smooth out as much as you can. Don't worry so much about if you don't have the confidence to do these little tiny surfaces, don't worry about it because this is just your disconnector. It's your trigger reset. You won't notice this as much as you will the sear disconnecting and dropping. That's, that's the motion that most people feel the grittiness right there as this drops off that, that ledge drops off. That's where you feel it. So put your most of your effort onto these surfaces more than anything. Um, but since we're here, I'll show you if you, is there any interest in, in sh showing you how to remove this thing from the gun? How, how would we replace it? Because this is a mil spec trigger that I polished in here and I can pull one out and show you what it looks like when it's done. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what I'm going to do is move my hammer forward. I'm going to take my, um, safety out, which, because you'll see right here that the hammer is moving up under the safety a little bit and it makes it really difficult to get that out of there, if not impossible on some of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this. And uh, word of warning, there is a little uh, spring and detent right up in here that's being held in place by this uh, pistol grip. So as you take it apart, uh, you want to be careful that you don't just pull the pistol grip off because you'll lose that little spring and detent. Ask me how I know. I always, uh, you know, once in a while I'll forget about it 
you know, just get in a hurry to throw a new pistol grip on and boing back to the parts jar to find another spring. So you get the right wrench. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm holding a little pressure upward the bottom of the um, pistol grip towards the, the uh, receiver just to give myself a little bit of pressure on there so I don't lose this thing. I'll slowly pull this away and show you where it's at when, I, when it becomes visible. This all the way out. You don't need to hold a lot of pressure on here. It's not it's not a, like a garage door spring or anything, but it will it will uh, launch if you're not aware of it. Say that like the rest of us know what a garage door spring actually actuates like. Oh man, if you, I used to have installed a few of them. There is a lot of stored energy in a garage door spring. Okay, so as you see right there, right here is that little spring. And that's holding a detent right there. You see the little brass piece? It, it, that spring is pushing up on that detent. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that aside and give it a tap. That little detent fell out right there. That's the piece that it's holding in. And then I can now just take my safety and wiggle it out. Theoretically. This is an 80% receiver I did. So some of these parts are a little bit snugger than normal. I might just get a punch and tap it a little bit. Yeah, come on out of there, mister. No, we'll just take the trigger out and then we'll pull that out to get it. So what we're gonna do to remove the trigger at this point is we have these two pins right here and right here. This is your hammer pin. So I just leave the hammer up I take a small punch and I'm just going to tap that out. And this is going to want to pop up. So I kind of just keep my hand over it a little bit, keep it from flying. Tap that punch, take a punch and tap that out of there. Not a gun video from Scott unless he uses a hammer. Hey, I, I, I sit down and think all night, what, where can I use a hammer? Where was a hammer? Where does a hammer fit in stoning a trigger, right? Okay, that one's, see it's popping out that side. But Any yeah. thoughts on using those anti-walk pins versus these? I've never style used style them. Pins? Uh, I don't see a reason not to if you're having a problem with the pins walking out. No, I was I thinking normally... a problem with you replacing your trigger all the time. You wouldn't have to tap oh. them out as much. Yeah. Now, all right, so that pin drops out almost, almost out of there. There we go. So there, see that pop forward? That was that spring tension. Okay, once that one's out of the way, you just do this rear one right here. And this one is going through your trigger and your disconnector. It's going through right there. Just to give you an idea what that is doing. Get the other punch, skinny punch. Like that. Okay, so there's our disconnector. We'll pull that out. Okay, now that takes some of the tension off of that. There's our safety. Now I can take my trigger out like so. Set the receiver aside. And then this is your hammer. You see, I don't know if this, this probably on the screen doesn't look any different than the other one, but it is a lot more polished. That's, that's really smooth right there and right there. And a little bit of work has been done on these other surfaces, but um, you know, I don't know this is really, really smooth. There's no friction when I run my pick across that. Those are all just baby butt smooth. So this, this trigger has a really clean snap, you know, just a, a really clean break. There's no stacking or kind of grittiness that you feel through the trigger as you're pulling it back. So that's how you would get one out. And then the, to put them back in is just the reverse. You just have to be careful of the alignment of these spring legs. And then 
when this one goes back in uh, like this, these legs have to ride over the top of that pin, but it's pretty straightforward. So that's, that's the uh, AR trigger assembly, how to get them out and how to polish them. And uh, another, this doesn't lighten the trigger. There's there, people uh, mistake the idea of smoothing or polishing a trigger with lightening the trigger pull, you know, take it from say five pounds to three pounds. That's not what this does. It may feel a little bit lighter because you have less friction that you're dealing with, but it's still gonna break at the same point. The way people lighten triggers on ARs is they cut one of these uh, spring legs off of the trigger spring. They'll cut about maybe that much of a spring leg off, off one side. I've never done it. I've never seen the point. Uh, even a mil spec trigger is not a really tough trigger pull. Um, but, you know, some people like to take things to that extreme or, or really want a super light trigger on a, on a battle rifle, which I don't get. Uh, maybe if it's a match rifle or a target rifle, but if you're going to do that, buy a Geisley or, a, you know, a, a drop-in trigger and do it right. So anyway, this doesn't lighten trigger pulls. It just smooths them. So any questions about that? Um, I mean, that went pretty fast. I can put the trigger back in if you want. Sure, let's do that. And we'll maybe we'll get some additional questions. Okay. While you're doing so, that. While you're doing that, there was a, a question earlier on when you were showing your blued parts from Karen. She wanted to know why, if it turns out looking black, why do they call it bluing? It, well, it, it when you polish it, it kind of gets a bluing color to it. It gets a blue color. This you know, you, you oil it and polish it, um, and it and it gets that deep, deep, deep blue, and it, and it gets bluer as it ages. I don't know if you've ever seen like an old Ruger and and um, Colt. Really, their bluing process gets a really deep purple blue to it as it ages. You'll see like on antique guns. Um, that that's I think where it comes from. Uh, you know that 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 name. So when you're putting the trigger in, you're going to start with your trigger piece and you see these springs, the way they're oriented like that, that's the spring tension is the bottom of the receiver is pushing up on that spring. So you just kind of drop it through the trigger well. Now this is the worst part of putting in a trigger. And uh, once we're done- A little bit of a glare in the front part of that uh, receiver. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it just no, drops- no, 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 Right there. That's good. Yeah. Okay. It just drops straight in there, right where you would think a trigger would go. Um, so I'm going to take a disconnector and the disconnector goes in, you know, it's pretty intuitive. This notch right here is, uh, corresponds to, it rides over that little spring inside the disconnector. There's a little spring right here. So this notch just goes right over the top of that. And then this hole aligns with the pinholes. So it can go in just like that. And the hard part of, of the AR trigger is now getting this pin in and aligning those holes simultaneously. So the way to do it, I found, is to take your punch, put it through, and then press down on the whole assembly as you do this and reach in there with your fingers and make sure you've, you've captured that uh, uh, disconnector. Because sometimes, if the pin goes in super easy, you probably didn't catch that disconnector. You're gonna to wanna to push down on it toward the bottom of the trigger. So once you've got it there, you can then take your pin and start it. Like that. Uh, and this one just, these are just never fun for me. Okay. See, we haven't, I just hate this pin in particular. Alrighty, why don't we want to, just not wanting to align, let's try a different pin or not. Yeah, you know, see, you can see where that's not 100% aligned. What maniac machined this thing, right? This is a 100% legal 80% receiver, just so you know. It was machined by me for me.
But I say this one is the most difficult. Once you get this one done, the rest of it's pretty easy. Pop that one out and try a different pin. You'll see on some of these kits too, the low end cheapy kits, the parts uh, say mil spec, but I'm not 100% sure they're built a spec. Uh, Aero Precision and some of those kits go together super easy because the parts are just machined to, and finished to a much better uh, quality than some of these cheapy uh, kits. So I'll get that all aligned properly. Hmm. Why is my spring leg not where I want it? Why did I volunteer to do this? I should have just kept my mouth shut. Button for punishment. I guess I well, am. You know, it, this was the, the this is the, uh, the, one of the what the third major blunders in uh, in yeah. history is uh, saying yeah, yes when Ed asks you to put a gun back together. <laughs> Never say yes. Could you explain that eighty percent lower thing? Sure. Um, there was a question on how you machine the lower and what you okay. started with. Yeah. So eighty percent lower is one you get uh, <laughs> to. Let me go grab one. I'll be right back. <laughs> Ed's got his ATF guy up again. <laughs> only, you know, it's not really an ATF problem, but it's only legal in certain jurisdictions. Don't do it yep. if you can't. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't be mindful of your local laws. Scott likes his 80% lowers. We'll let him come back. I think he, I don't think he quite realizes that we're live on like five different outlet one in the junk Areas. pile right now but what it is i'll take this out is you get the receiver from the manufacturer you know basically this piece and when you get it this is all solid aluminum that's just a complete block uh and this this hole and these holes are not drilled the trigger hole is not drilled so it's it's basically 80 percent complete yeah, and the law says that if you are completing at least 20% of the gun, then that's that's legal. You can manufacture a gun for personal use. So you cannot give the gun away. You cannot sell it. It dies with you. So basically this receiver would have to be destroyed when I'm gone. And you can salvage everything else off the gun, but the receiver um, can't be. Uh, I, I, I think you could sell it, but you'd have to serialize it. Yeah, so you would have to take be, it to, it's going to be dependent on the jurisdiction. Yeah, in California yeah. you have to serialize. Yeah, in Oregon and most other states you would take it into a trophy engraver and there's a there's a specification from the ATF as to how deep and the and the size and font you're going to want to use to engrave it with a serial number. The serial number could be anything you want. Um, but anyway, you get the thing, you have a jig. I have a jig that this fits into and you mill out all of this metal here following the jig and then you drill these holes and, and uh, assemble it as a firearm. And it's perfectly legal in most states. Once again, check your local laws because California is a different animal. Here in Oregon, nobody cares. There's no big deal. You can order them. They show up at your doorstep. And uh, But in California, if you're going to receive an 80% lower you have to have it serialized before it comes into the state and i think the doj registers that serial number before you even get it you get approval from the doj and then i think they give you the serial number don't they yeah well that, 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 that's something we're gonna have to check but i think that sounds right yeah, yeah. I think they uh they issue you you have to you have to request the serial number they issue the serial number yeah um and then they have specific fonts just like oregon they have a specific font uh, and depth of engraving that it must uh, that it must yeah. make. Yeah, and then once you have that, then you can now mill it out, which you know sort of defeats to me the. Per I mean, if you're really just curious about the knowledge of how to do it, they're great for that. But if you're you want an un unserialized gun, then California is not the place to own one because you really can't. There we go. There's that pin. So. So that only took questionable legal advice. Uh, what about six minutes for you to put the gun back together? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So that pins in. That's captured. Now what we have to do is take our hammer and hammer spring. So this way we want our hammer to slam forward that way. That's striking the uh, firing pin. 
so to put the get the proper tension on the spring you rotate the spring around and then we're going to push it in and bend those legs those legs have to ride over the top of the pin we just put in people make the mistake of getting them under there and it doesn't work so you drop it in and this probably isn't going to show up very well but these legs are over the top of this pin and then you have to kind of bend and push down on the hammer and get it aligned once again using our punch to get it like that so at this point if we pull the trigger it goes forward now all we have to do is replace that punch with a pin and we have a fully functional trigger so back that out push this in yeah now you there's a lot of weird laws around the 80 percent um done thing oops trigger just released on me but so i don't know why fun. you agreed to put a gun back together on screen i don't know i'm a glutton for punishment <laughs> I just enjoy the, the the mockery and contempt of my fellow man. Oh, go that there. Far. So now it's done. So there's a trigger. So and you do not want to you don't want to take this trigger and pull it, let it slam into that face right here. That will break your receiver. So if you're gonna you want to test it, just put a dowel or something there and check it like so. So now if you notice the triggers back, I pull the trigger, it rides forward, strikes the firing pin. As I hold the trigger down, it comes back and catches on the disconnector. As I let go of the disconnector, it resets into that sear notch and is ready to pull again. So that's the whole full trigger cycle of a uh, AR. Let me get this back in there. And you can see the notch, just while we're in here, might as well show it. Uh, this little notch right here is where that detent rides. That's what that detent is pushing into, just so you have an idea of what we're talking about while we're into the guts of this poor gun. So. And no, we're not gonna show you where the third hole goes. No, I can give you a general idea. But... No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I would not never do it unless I had a, uh, Type army? seven FFL. An yeah. army of lawyers next. Well, year. I just don't want to. <laughs> I'm sorry, but as much fun as and I I fired full auto. As much fun as it is, it is not worth ten years of my life to replicate in the forest with a bunch of beer drinking goons. So there we go. So that goes in there like that. We now drop our little detent down the hole, pointy end down. Yeah course with my ham fingers then i take my spring i push it now we'll do the spring in the handle we'll take the spring put it in here and then this is kind of tricky to keep the spring in the right place as you slide this on there so you will notice i'm trying to keep that spring in line with that detent and then push down holding a little pressure on it tighten up your screw and that's really, that's how you would do a AR trigger. Uh, a drop-in trigger, uh, Geisley, it's all the same process. Um, you know, popping those pins out, put the new one in, replace the pins. Um, so that's it. So I'll go ahead and finish polishing up this trigger and then I'm gonna leave it in Danielle's uh, capable hands as to where it goes from here. But uh, if you uh, get it and you hate it, um, I don't wanna hear about it, it was free. You, you got what you paid for. <laughs> and you get to pass it along. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, you can use it as a sinker. So you see, we're, now we're checking our safety, making sure the safety works. I'm gonna put it in fire, pull the trigger, hold the trigger back, make sure it resets, fires, safe. So it function checks. Okay, that's that. That's AR okay. triggers basically in a nutshell. We have another question here for you. Sure. Other than polishing the trigger, anything about most mil spec kits or parts that you really don't like and recommend buying upgrades? No, no, I mean, if you're just building an AR to go target shooting and plinking with, or you're on a budget, 
you can buy a Palmetto State Armory kit and put it together. And I recommend building your first one because it's not difficult and you'll understand the gun a lot better. So when you get malfunctions, you'll understand the gun from every aspect of it because you've assembled it and you can start troubleshooting it uh, based on your knowledge of it versus just taking it into a gunsmith and having him, you know, charge you 50 bucks to do something you could have done in the field. Um, and I've, I've assembled Anderson and Palmetto State lowers and aero precision lowers all the way up to the super expensive ones. The fit and finish is much better on the higher end stuff. Uh, the parts kits are just smoother things to go together. Uh, you know, like the aero precision uses uh, little Allen screws in place of some of the pins, which makes assembly nicer and easier. It makes replacement nicer and easier, but mill spec works. Um, you know, there are, if you research some of the no name kits, like you can't go wrong with like CMMG or DPMS. I've had really good and Anderson, um, those kits generally, they always have the right number of parts and they generally go together pretty well, but I've bought some generic, just cheap, um, lower parts kits from various vendors just to have on hand. And there, some of them can be problematic, like that safety. Some of those are a little bit oversized or undersized. They'll work, but they rattle, you know, around in the gun a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, but if you, if you stick with Anderson or Palmetto, you'll be fine. And then, you know, once you built the gun and run it a little bit, you'll have a much better idea of what you want to upgrade and how to do it. You know, you can get by with a mill spec trigger for a long time. And then when you decide that your needs have changed, you know, buy a Geisley and put it in. But I don't think you with can go regards to... to the lower parts kits. Uh huh. What do you recommend for lubrication on the parts in the lower itself? I only I just lubricate the springs. I just put a little bit of like, you know, let's say a trigger spring. I'll just take a little bit of gun oil and I'm more worried about corrosion than I am lubrication so much. I'll just lubricate the spring a little bit to keep it from, you know, getting dry and, and, and uh, rusty. Um, and then I, I lubricate the pins. Uh, when I lubricate the gun, I'll put a little drop of oil. Um, that's why I like these needle balls is I can put a little drop of oil on these pins right there and there. And that's really all you need. You maybe could put a little bit of grease on the safety if you wanted to, but there's just not much moving mass in here. You know, there's just not, it's the springs and the pins that really are doing all of the lifting in one of these. And then I take either compressed air or canned air and I, you know, I blow out dust and crud, um, but that's pretty much all I do on them. You know, you might want to put a little drop of oil, maybe on your mag release. Um, maybe your takedown pins, you know, a little grease on the takedown pins. But you're just, there's just not a lot of lubrication in one of them. I mean, other people may differ, but that's what I do. And I've run them for, you know, 5,000 rounds between cleanings with no issues. We have one last live question. Yeah. Uh, and that was, well, it disappeared on me. Here we go. Earlier in the video, you mentioned the polishing the hammer face. Uh -huh. uh, you want to restate what you were talking about with regards to having to do that and why? Oh, I just did it to show the difference between the two surfaces and what I wanted the end result to be. Uh, because to me, where I'm sitting, this, this face had a dull matte finish to it. And I wanted to show what it looked like, what I wanted it to look like when I was done. So I polished the hammer face. It doesn't need to be done. It was just, it's kind of overkill. I just did it to illustrate uh, visually what I was after. Um, so there's no real reason to do it. I, you know, I just did it because I wanted to show people the, the shininess between a finished surface and a, you know, the right off the assembly line surface. So don't, you don't need to polish your hammer face unless you're super bored but there's no, probably, probably not smart. It might rust actually. I don't know. Okay. Well, that was the last question. So All right. as always folks can join us in the pub for more questions after this. Uh, All right. 
Okay. I'll continue to polish this and get it in the mail. Ed, who are you uh, giving the, the trigger uh, to? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna have a I'm gonna we can talk about it in the pub. Okay. Uh, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> but uh, hey, Scott, thank you again. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully next week we're gonna see the parts for that trench gun. Yeah. If not, um, you know, I have some other ideas. We could talk about stuff. I. <laughs> I can't resist. I bought a Colt. Um, I got a Colt uh, vest pocket coming tomorrow. Oh, the 1908? 1908? What's that? The 1908, the little, the little itty bitty 25. Pocket. Yeah, yeah, a little 25 vest pocket. I always wanted one and found a deal on one. And I also bought a Colt Detective Special that I that it does. They they say it it's not working properly. So like, well, that's right in my wheelhouse. So I might. If I don't have the handguard by then, I might just take that Colt Detective Special as it sits and take it apart on screen and see if we can all together figure out what's going on with it. That sounds fun. I also yeah. I also want to see you take apart the baby, the baby Colt because those things. That, I'm going to practice before I. Submit yeah, those things are terrifying. <laughs> They're tiny. <laughs> yeah, I've taken apart a, a Spanish Ruby, which is essentially the same gun. Yeah, um spanish one not, not the yeah it's yeah. It, but it's you know uh, it, it's almost identical as far as the footprint of it goes and the mechanism it's it's a direct copy of it um but i think the detective special would be kind of fun yeah you, you, we can do it we can do it live and we can watch you fail repeatedly absolutely and see if we can see if we can figure out sometimes all it needs is is just cleaning you know you, you open it up and there's just pocket crud and grease in there and you clean it all up and the thing cycles just fine other times you look in there and you'll see a broken part or uh, a lever that's not on a post or something. And, you know, that that's fixes it. But we might if we find a broken part, I've looked around and, and they made that gun from 1927 to 1969. So parts are readily available. Well, all right. I think we are good. Um, all right. Again, uh, yep. thank you, Kyle and Danielle and Lonnie for helping moderate. Yeah, and thanks everybody for showing up and, and at least pretending to be engaged and humoring me. I enjoy it. And uh, I'll, I'll post I'll post something clever in the blog post about getting stoned. Okay. Uh, and uh, that said, if you guys don't know how to get in Discord, you should figure that out by now because this is like the, I don't know, the seventh month we've been doing this. So you should yeah. know what Discord is by now. But if you don't, uh, ping one of us on Facebook or on Twitter or on the forums or however the hell you found us for the uh, registration tonight, and we'll get you in there. All right. Uh, and uh, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and kill the stream. And everybody have a great night. And we'll talk okay. to you soon.